We are very fortunate to have with us today a teacher, scholar, and activist whose careful and unflinching examination of the social and institutional contexts in which racism operates has so informed our understanding of social justice education. Dr. Robin D'Angelo received her PhD in multicultural education in 2004 at the University of Washington in Seattle. She earned tenure at Westfield State University in 2014 and then returned to the Northwest to serve as a lecturer in the School of Social Work at the University of Washington. In addition to her academic appointments, Dr. D'Angelo has been a consultant and trainer on issues related to race and social justice for more than two decades. These latter responsibilities and achievements include being appointed to co-design the City of Seattle's Race and Social Justice Initiative Anti-Racism Training. Dr. D'Angelo's scholarly achievements include two influential books. The first, Is Everybody Really Equal? An Introduction to Key Concepts in Critical Social Justice Education, won the American Educational Studies Association's Critics' Choice Award in 2012. A new edition of her second book, What Does It Mean to Be White? Developing White Racial Literacy, was just published last year. The author of many other articles and book chapters, we had the privilege of publishing one of Dr. D'Angelo's recent essays in the journal Democracy and Education, which is housed at the Graduate School and has an international readership. We also used that article entitled Respect Difference, Challenging the Common Guidelines in Social Justice Education in a faculty and staff dialogue led by our diversity committee. I mention the article here not only because of the impact it has had on our own community, but also as an example of Dr. D'Angelo's keen ability to sharply analyze and constructively critique the sometimes too comfortable understandings and customary practices that even self-identified social justice educators invoke. At the same time, Dr. D'Angelo's work makes clear that she has not arrived at some destination ahead of the rest of us. Rather, through her scholarship and community activism, Dr. D'Angelo shows all of us that this path is neither a single route nor a place where the journey ends. In order to make progress in our efforts to promote social justice, Dr. D'Angelo both advocates and models the difficult work of examining how we are shaped by our experience of race, gender, social class, and other elements of our complex social identities. To engage these differences honestly, inquisitively, and with humility is part of the path forward. To understand when to speak, when to listen, and how to push ourselves past easy and safe understandings to where the hardest questions lie. This is where Dr. D'Angelo serves as one of our finest guides. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robin D'Angelo. Good, good morning. Uh, it is such a profound honor to be here uh, and to address you on such an exciting and momentous day. I thank you to the dean and the faculty for making this happen. And I also want to acknowledge that this ceremony is taking place today on the ancestral territories of indigenous. So each one of you took a different path to arrive at this moment. For some of you, college was always an expectation. You had family and economic support for which we know you are grateful. On the other hand, I know that some of you are sitting here today with a sense of amazement. Like myself, you were the first in your families to go to college, much less graduate school. Some of you had to work and or raise children and support family members while you studied. Some of you completed your studies while navigating disabilities and learning differences. For some of you, very little in the environment or the curriculum reflected or validated your identity or experience. And still you persevered, you survived, and hopefully you thrived. But regardless of the boundaries or barriers you may have faced, all of you here today now have something in common. You hold a very important piece of social capital, a graduate degree. Only 12% of the US population attains one. You are members of an elite group. Your degrees will open doors for you. They will give your voice more weight. You will sit at the tables where decisions are made. 
Decisions that will impact those who are not sitting at the table, whose voices are not heard. And your position may at times make it difficult for you to notice who's been left out. It may make you not even really care to rely on the ideologies of individualism and meritocracy to rationalize their absence. So we must remember that how we think about the world shapes what we see in the world and in turn how we respond to what we see. And we are all aware of the racial violence last week here in Portland. And while it is shocking to me, I imagine that the bigotry that fueled that incident is not shocking to those who endure it on a daily basis. And though I don't imagine that anyone here today would perpetrate the terrorism we are now seeing emboldened, I believe deeply that we cannot separate ourselves from the society we live in. It is not an either or proposition. It is not a simple matter of a few bad people and the rest of us as good. We all play a role and our task is not to exempt ourselves from that role, but to continually struggle to identify what it is. As Audre Lorde reminds us, the true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations which we seek to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us. For example, I grew up in poverty. We were evicted four to five times a year in my childhood. I had no health or dental care. We occasionally had to live in our car, and I was sometimes left with strangers for months at a time while my mother tried to secure housing for us. I am always taken aback by people who say, well, we were poor, but we had so much love we didn't notice. Uh, poverty hurts, hunger is sharp, homelessness is humiliating, and I noticed. But the real meaning of poverty crystallized for me one day when, one, when we were visiting another family. And as we were leaving, I heard one of their daughters ask her mother, what's wrong with them? And I stopped, riveted. I too wanted to know. And her mother held her finger to her lips and she said, shh, they're poor. And this was a profound moment for me, that there was something wrong with us that everyone could see but should not be named. And it took me many years to gain a structural analysis of class that would help me mediate that shame. And I share the story of my class background because it so deeply informs my understanding of another of my key identities, my race. From an early age, I had the sense of being an outsider. I was acutely aware that I was poor and that that meant that there was something wrong with me. But I also always knew that I was white. I still held whiteness. I was at the bottom, but there was somebody underneath propping me up. And through the constant messages that I was better than this other, I could feel normal. And race was the one identity that aligned me with the middle class white people that my poverty had separated me from. I left home as a teenager and struggled to survive. As I looked at what lay ahead, I could see no path out of poverty other than education. And the decision to take that path was frightening for me. I had never gotten the message that I was smart, and academia was a completely foreign uh, context. But once I was in academia, I understood that a college degree is not awarded to those who are smarter or who try harder than others. It comes through a complex web of social capital that include internal expectations as well as external resources. In academia, my race helped me navigate class-based barriers. And I now ask myself how the classist messages I received growing up and internalized caused me to collude in someone else's oppression, racism. 
For example, as a child who grew up in poverty, I received constant reminders that I was lazy, stupid, and a drain on the resources of hardworking people. I internalized those messages, and they have worked to silence me. If I don't uproot them, I will not trust my perceptions or feel like I have a right to speak when I notice racism. And so in academia, and maybe some of you can relate, I struggle with feelings of being an imposter. And at the same time, I have noticed a lot of racism in academia. But I have often been silent about that because I have felt intellectually inferior to my fellow white colleagues. My fear is coming from a place of internalized inferiority, not, not arrogance, but in practice, my silence ultimately benefits me by maintaining racial solidarity with other white people. My silence will position me as a team player and I will get ahead in academia as a white person who doesn't challenge racism. So I remind myself that I am actually not inferior to middle class people. That is a lie. And when I push through that lie to use my voice against racial injustice, I am simultaneously healing my own internalized class inferiority while using my privileged racial position to interrupt racism. History is not a straight line always leading toward progress. Progress must be fought for and then defended with vigilance. For example, just as politicians have begun to reassess the enormous suffering and injustice of mass incarceration, our government is returning to the punitive and devastating methods of the drug war. Just as we are making minimal efforts to address climate change, these efforts are reversed. Just as healthcare got slightly more humane, these efforts are undermined, and funding is being cut for women's reproductive rights. And these decisions, as always, affect the most vulnerable. We simply do not have time for complacency. The shroud has been lifted from white supremacy and the patriarchy it rests upon, and they will not be checked without active resistance. The default of our society is the reproduction of inequality, and all that is needed for inequality to continue is for those of us with the best of intentions to be very nice, to be friendly and open-minded, to be concerned. Now, I'm not saying don't be nice, but niceness is not courageous. Niceness will not get deeply charged issues like racism on the table, and niceness will not keep it on the table when powerful others want it off. When naming racial inequity is met with silence, defensiveness, or hostility. In fact, raising these issues will often be seen as not nice. So it will take courage, it will take humility, and a sense of oneself as a lifelong learner, never finished, never already knowing. So I urge you to always ask, whom have we left out? whose perspectives are missing, and most importantly, how do I know? To whom have I been? This may seem heavy and daunting, it is, and yet it is also the most transformative and liberating work we can possibly do. Once we start from the premise that there is no neutral ground, we can stop working to defend, deny, or deflect from our inevitable complicity, and we can eagerly seek to identify how we are complicit, and then we can stop that. We become grateful for the guidance of others and less attached to how that guidance is given. There is no more fulfilling work than to use your positions to act strategically in the continuing struggle for justice. It is all before you. Congratulations on this incredible lifelong journey, and thank you so much.
Parker. Thank you. President Ellis, it gives me great pleasure to present Dr. Robin D'Angelo for the awarding of the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> Through your teaching, and not least, great candor in discovering and revealing your own privilege and prejudice, you have broken new ground in our understanding of racism. In developing the construct of white fragility, you expand our knowledge and awareness of the many ways racism, racism is manifest. You also provide us with language and methods for breaking through personal denial in order to create positive behaviors within individuals and constructive change within communities. In recognition of your distinguished contributions to anti-racist and multicultural education as a teacher, educator, scholar, and public intellectual, and for your extraordinary commitment to equity and social justice in public schooling, Lewis and Clark is honored this day to confer upon you, Robin D'Angelo, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. <laughs> 